Okay. Um. Um. So yeah, Winston. Um. Uh. How? What made you first come to China? What made you decide to come to China? Okay. Well, as you know, in the last few years, I've been um, living in the Philippines, and you know, I had a great time there. But you know, I just felt like all the girls I was dating was um. Kind of liked me f for economic m reasons, like they were motivated mostly by by their poverty and the need f for money. So I kind of felt like, um, like like, you know, I I guess I could say I was being used, but I mean it just didn't feel like a genuine equal relationship. So I didn't feel very complete um, with you know my dating experiences in the Philippines. I I mean they were fun and stuff. I just felt like. Um, like if I wanted a serious partner, the Philippines wouldn't be the right place because, um, yeah, there's some culture differences, and I, it just seemed like like you know like their class and and you know I mean economically there was just a wide disparity between them and me, and I just felt like it wasn't a natural genuine relationship. And um, then when I started going to Taiwan, I, I started realizing that um, China would probably um, be better for me because I felt like I was more attracted to, to Chinese women and Chinese culture um, because um, my ethnicity is Chinese or, or Taiwanese if you want to be more specific. So I felt like it would dating my own race would be more natural and, and plus the Chinese women seem more um, intelligent and, and higher quality and more educated and more able to 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 help me and and to contribute to the relationship, whereas in the Philippines, most uh, girls that date a foreigner are, are usually ex extremely poor and cannot contribute anything, and um, and so it it feels too one sided. Whereas a, a relationship with a Chinese girl feels more and more balanced and mutual and more like a like like a genuine relationship, and and it makes me feel more complete too because you know I, I'm dating women that are you know that share my my heritage and culture and genes so it just felt more complete yeah yeah but um can i ask Winston? i mean what was your impression of chinese women before you came to china and has that changed dramatically since since you arrived in china i mean has 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 your being in china changed your whole your 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 your, your preconceptions of chinese women before coming to china oh yes of course because um, before I came to China, my impressions of Chinese women were limited to, to um, Taiwan and also to Asian American women in, in the States. And so my impression of them wasn't as good because the ones in, in the U.S. seem more materialistic and more arrogant and snobby. And, and of course, they're more Americanized. Also in Taiwan, they just seem more cliquish and, and um, uptight and, and not as um, down to earth. Um, so my impression of Chinese people and, and women were that they were more narrow-minded and harder to connect with but when I came here I was surprised because um, the women here I mean of course you know they're, they're, they're Chinese and I know Chinese culture but the women here were just so you know authentic and when they walk around their body language is not paranoid or uptight I mean, there's it's just a different vibe and, and body language. Yeah, I know. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, I was interested because you mentioned to me the other day. Um, um, before in China, you were uh, uh, you were in Hong Kong, right? And um, you told me like the the moment you step into China, the moment you took the the train across and you you, you went to like um, Fuming Station in Shenzhen, uh, you came out of the, of the subway station and you felt a completely different vibe. I mean, wh what was it like to you? You could see like a completely diff uh, a different um, a social atmosphere. You could feel a completely different social atmosphere between Hong Kong and, and, and China. Um, so can you describe like how, how it felt the first time you, 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 know, you, 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 you actually walked on a Chinese street and you, you went, went public in China? Yeah, I mean, I was a little bit scared and nervous because I was taking the subway from Hong Kong and then walking across the border, the immigration border in, into China and I didn't know what to expect because every country is like a different world and so I was kind of nervous because I've heard so many things about China, good and bad, and I didn't know what to expect. It just seemed like stepping into the unknown. So, so yeah, I was a little bit bewildered and um, yeah, because each country is like a different planet. So right when I came to China and, and walked out of the subway station, I, I noticed that 
the body language of people is just so different and, and it's hard to put into words but they just walk with this authenticity and, and that's so genuine and down to earth and there's just no paranoia in, in the way they, they, their vibe, their body language. And, and I'm not used to that because over in, in Taiwan and in, in America, I mean, the, the women and people in general, they do have an uptight body language that's more closed and closed off and standoffish and more paranoid. And so, um, yeah, so if you've seen mainland Chinese immigrants in America, you might have noticed this too a little bit. But yeah, over in China, it's more where you see it everywhere. It, it's... Uh, it's different, and it, it's a bit difficult to put into words, but it, it just seemed more genuine. And the thing is, even if they're you know, rude or abrupt, I mean, the thing is, it, it's genuine, and that's refreshing and, and honest. And so I experienced some of that this before when I was in Russia three times, because in Russia, people are also very authentic and genuine and, and blunt, and they tell you what they think. I mean, there's no fake politeness there, just like in China. So I was already used to that, but... Of course, China is going to be a little bit different than Russia, but in terms of authenticity, it's it's a, a little similar, yeah. Yeah, and also I feel like you get that vibe when you're walking in, in um, countries that are more westernized or in a, a countries that are part of the Anglosphere, that, you know, on the streets, you feel like people... <laughs> People are judging you, like like you know. Even when you walk in the streets, people seem to be looking at you, how you dress, uh, how you carry yourself, how you walk. You're being scrutinized, and and there's this vibe that people don't really trust each other. Like people need to scrutinize each other before they trust each other. Whereas when you're in China, I, I think you you get this feeling like people are more relaxed. They they're not, you know, they're not out to judge you. Um, they allow they 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 allow you to be yourself when and and you know. You know, so there's this relaxed vibe when you walk on the streets in China, and that was also when I first came to China. One of the biggest things I, the biggest differences I noticed uh, between China and and where I lived before in both uh, uh, Singapore and America. Yeah, um, that's a really good point because, I mean, when you grow up in America, you don't notice like you don't have anything to compare it to, so you assume that people all over the world are uptight and and closed and paranoid and. Um, don't talk to strangers, but w once you start going to different countries like China or the Philippines or to Russia, um, which which I've been to, um, you start to realize that it's not normal at all the way Americans are, this this closed, uh, uptight um, body language with, with no social connection at all, which makes America very isolating and lonely. That's the key thing about America. There's no social connection. You So you, you feel like you're very isolated and lonely and you're not like you're, you're cut off and disconnected from people and, and you know and that um, yeah it makes a lot of people unhappy but for some reason this is a taboo subject that's not often talked about um, and yeah and also when you're in America you don't feel confident or secure because there's this vibe from people that's so judgmental and it makes you feel like you're not good enough or you're, you're insecure and um, it makes you doubt yourself so it's hard to be confident that's why in America people struggle with staying confident or struggle with their self-esteem and, and struggle with um, just general confidence and, and whereas here it's not an issue because you don't feel like something's trying to tear your ego down I mean this is a little hard to explain you know but that's the best way I can explain it it's one of those things you have to experience to really appreciate but I've done the best I can with words to ex explain it. But I'm just saying, once you get out of America, you start to and see the difference. Then you start to understand more. Um, but it also depends on how sensitive you are too, because some people are more sensitive to um, vibes than others and cultures, and some aren't. So it depends on the person too. Yeah. Yeah, but I think I mean vibes are an indication of this social atmosphere of the place that if you don't detect them through social vibes, you will eventually detect them through the way people actually treat you and your your social life within a place. So, you know, um, it's, yeah, it's just a, a, basically a start, starting point, I mean, for, for, for um, getting a better idea of how things work in that country. Um, sorry, I have to pause about <laughs> Well, yeah, so... Um, so yeah, so let me ask you, so you came from Singapore, how, how would you compare people there to here, I mean? Yeah, uh, it's interesting because, um, I mean, Singapore is, as you probably know, is, is Chinese dominated as well, so 
technically speaking, you know, uh, Ch Singapore is a country do dominated by overseas Chinese. Um, but Singapore is, is, you know, a very, I guess, a very first world advanced country now that has received a lot of Western influence due to its uh, previously being a British colony. And also now it's currently, you know, it's run as a very open economy, very open to foreign immigration, foreign influence. Um, English is the first, first language, national language in Singapore. So, um, you know, most people will probably describe Singapore as a gateway to Asia and, and also the most uh, westernized country in Asia. Um, so, my experience uh, with uh, Singaporean women is, is that, you know, they're, they're in general more, much more westernized than, than Chinese women. I mean, um, you know, uh, sing in many ways, Singaporean women feel more like, like American women than they, or, or, or American um, uh, uh, just ABCs in, in, China, in America than they, they do feel like, um, I guess, typical Asian women. Um, so, yeah, um, yeah, and, and, I mean, I would say that, that uh, you know, coming to China has been a, a very different experience for me. Um, you know, are, are, yeah. are, is Singapore really materialistic? I mean, it's a first world country, right? I mean, is it easy to make friends there or to, to meet women or what, what is... Uh, like? Singapore is, is very materialistic. Um, uh, yeah, Singapore is a, a hyper-competitive society. Um, and, and um, you know, I, it's it's... I I I I've I've said to certain friends before that it seems to to mix the worst of both Asian and Western cultures into uh, into one country, um, uh yeah and it's a hyper competitive society um so you know everyone is comparing you know just trying to keep up the Joneses and comparing you know themselves to the people around them so there is this constant pressure to to keep up and to be better than the next person. And, and even if you're, you know, there are a lot of wealthy people in Singapore, but even if you're wealthy, you, you still feel poor because you always know someone that's much wealthier than you. So um, Singapore is, you know, I would say, uh, you know, due to many um, political and, 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 and cultural reasons now, um, it's a, it's a hyper-competitive society and, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely not a good place to live in if, if you're, if, if you're, the, you know, uh, you're looking for a more relaxed uh, pace of life and, you know, you're looking to for for a more, um, uh, I guess, a, a healthier social environment. Um, but yeah, uh, when I, I mean, when I first came to China, uh, which was, pause it for. <laughs> uh, when you first came to China, uh, what? Pause it. Oh, okay, okay. Wait, hold on, hold on. Um, when you first came to China, you noticed a difference, right? Or <laughs> yeah. A big difference, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. When I first came to China, okay. Um, can you pause it? Pause it. I just need a break. <laughs> okay, no, we can talk about that later. Um, no, no, no. Why, why don't we talk about um, about freedoms in China that you don't have in America? Because a lot of people are, especially in the West, are, and also in Taiwan, are under this impression that China has no freedom and that, that the government is, is tyrannical or fascist. And we don't experience that in, in China at all because we walk around everywhere in China and say what we want and do what we want and, and there are no police or security telling us what to do. I mean, I don't see why China is not a free country. I mean, and plus, you know, the, the security and the police, I mean, they're very soft-spoken and polite. I mean, they don't bother you or bully you and, and when they talk to you, it's very, with a very soft-spoken voice. Um, so, I mean, they're not bullies or, or a-holes like, like the police in America. And so, you know, I don't experience any restrictions on freedom in China, you know, other than just basic laws and basic c civility. So, uh, yeah, we don't experience any lack of freedom in China. In, in fact, I think there's more freedom in China than in America and Singapore um, in a lot of ways, and in, in some ways even more than in Taiwan. So I don't know why there's this perception overseas that China is a tyranny and has no freedom because we don't experience that and you know as Albert Einstein said experience is more important than knowledge so, so um, I mean I mean experience is more important than information so true knowledge comes from experience not from information you read on the news or on the internet I mean when you experience China real in reality um, first per first hand then you know the real China, and so you know what it's like, right? You know, because if you listen to the media, you get a really negative view of China, and um, I don't experience 
all that negativity at all. And um, um, so, yeah, w w why don't we talk about some of the freedoms you have in China that um, you don't have in, in America? Um, one is like, well, is it true? Yes, yeah. yeah. E in our WeChat group, Ethan and some of the other guys said that you could set up um, a stand on the street to, to sell stuff and make a living without getting an expensive permit, which keeps prices low. Um, because the, uh, in China, the streets belong to the people, and you know, which it should. Whereas in America, you'd have to buy an expensive permit because everything is privatized, and then that would raise the prices of everything you sell on the street. And plus, the laws are so anal. I mean, kids used to be able to sell lemonade in front of their house in the neighborhood, which, you know, has been an American tradition for, I don't know, m many decades. And all of a sudden, the government started getting anal and said, oh, we don't know what's in that lemonade, so they can't allow kids to sell lemonade on the street, which, you know, back in the 60s or 70s or 80s, that would have been laughed at. So, yeah, America's freedom is becoming less and less, as we all know. So, you know, so... So yeah, I mean that's one, one freedom. I mean there's many others, but is it true you can just set up a stand outside, on the street in China and, and sell whatever you want? Or? Uh, well, in, in I mean I'm sure there in in the first year cities there, there you know there are some certain restrictions in certain parts of the cities now, um, becoming more controlled than they were before. But yeah, in general throughout China, I mean you do see in, in many streets you know street vendors and and people. Uh, setting up shops at night, uh, you know, informal, uh, basically informal stores on the streets, um, uh, you know, especially at night, um, sometimes in the daytime as well, uh, selling food. Selling and, and they don't need a permit or a license? Or yeah, in general, they don't need a permit. They don't have to pay rent. Um, there is no formal application process for, 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 you know, for being for being a street vendor. Okay, um, so basically you can't set up a shop or a stand like you know, on, on a big commercial street where businesses are, are doing business, but you can, like in a night market or a residential area or maybe yeah, a yeah. little side alley or something? Or? Yeah, I, I, I mean, you probably have to ask a local to be sure, but from my understanding, like, you know, this, this it, the, I mean, the, the boundaries aren't as strictly defined as they are in, in, in many other more, more, more developed countries. So, um, yeah, people generally have the freedom to uh, sell their stuff and, and, and they don't have to pay rent on it. So, Generally, I mean, this this definitely I mean decreases the cost of the goods that they sell and helps keep the cost of living down. I mean, traditionally speaking, this was, was a freedom that that people took for granted. But in the modern world, I mean, this is something that you know we don't see a lot in developed countries and and you know you, in, in in places like where I'm from, Singapore, you, you know this this would be completely illegal. You you need a, a special permit for this, which which will typically not be granted. Um, I mean, part of the reason is that. Um, I mean, the, the, the elite at the top, they, they dominate all all this property. I mean, all you see, technically all this, this land should belong to the public, right? The land land should belong to the public. I mean, but in, in countries where, which are, I guess, more developed and more westernized, modernized, um, a lot of the land is dominated by the elite. So um, this land, um, in order to use that land to, to sell to the public, I mean, to, to sell products to the public, um, you need a permit from the government. So uh, then you you know, and typically what will happen is that you need to pay rent for for you know uh, to, to to be able to set up stores in these places. So that increases your cost of doing business and that increases the cost of living within the country. So I mean, China is kind of in that transitionary stage be uh, between uh, a developing country and a developed country. So you you do see the the differences, the contrasts uh, between you know the old and the new and and what society was in the past and what it is now. Yeah, and, and that's important because for a lot of people, I mean, you know, it, they're, they're, the only way they can make a living is by selling stuff on the street, you know, like some products or food. And, and so they have, they need to be able to do that in order to make a living. And so, but you can't do that in America because everything is privatized and everything is controlled. So America actually has less freedom than most countries. Plus the laws in America are the highest in the world. So how can the country with the most laws in the world be the freest country as it claims so it, it, it's it's like everything America claims is the opposite of reality and that's what you know we want to expose here because it's like yeah it's like most people just don't know the truth and they don't get a fair and balanced um, view on things they don't get 
they don't see a fair and balanced view of the pic, um, picture of everything. So, um, so we want to bring some some fairness and balance into people's perception of things like this. Um, as for me, I mean, the most important thing is is that in China I feel free to be honest about and to be myself. Like for example, um, in America, if somebody asks you how you're doing, you always have to say you're doing great, even if you're not, because there's this pressure to keep up this facade that you're happy 24 hours a day and that everything is going great. So even when things are not, you still have to lie and pretend to, to that everything is great because to put up the facade. And so the culture in America is fake and forces you to be dishonest in order to, to conform to being great every day. So, But we all know that life is not always great and that there's an up cycle and down cycle and that the universe has positive energy and negative energy and both of them are real and that as Eastern philosophy teaches that the key is to balance and harmonize positive and negative energies, the, the opposite energies, just like depicted in the in the Chinese yin yang symbol that you know you all know the with the black and white yin yang symbol that symbolizes the union of opposites. So um so you gotta acknowledge positive and negative things and harmonize them and that's the key to balance. But in American culture, there's no harmony. They try to focus only on the positive and forget and suppress all the negative, which um, is not natural. And you're going against, if you go against Mother Nature, I mean, and all that's natural, you eventually lose. So, um, so you, you have, so it's a very fake culture that tries to do that. So, but in, in China, you don't have, you can be more honest. You know, you don't have to say you're doing great every day. You can um, be honest and say you're not doing great. So there's this freedom to be honest that's very really refreshing, and because if you if you if you're not free to be yourself and free to be honest, then you're not free, because being who you are is the ultimate epitome and definition of freedom, I think. So, so yeah, you can be honest about that, and also, um, me and my friends like to criticize things like you know this liberalism, like. We'd like to talk about racial differences and gender differences, the, the obvious differences between men and women and between different races and ethnicities. They're, they're very obvious that everyone can see and we all know these differences, but for some reason they're, they're taboo in America to talk about, whereas in China you can talk about them and, um, and, and it's okay because they're obvious. So there's not as much political correctness in China as there is in America. So you're free to be honest when it comes to, to racial differences, gender differences, and how you feel about them. And you don't get that. Because in America, if you, if you talk about the differences between races or between men and women, you'll get accused of racism or stereotyping or sexism. And you could lose a lot of friends and you could even lose your job in America if you talk about those things because it's a t big taboo to be anti-liberal in America. You can be anti-American, you can criticize the government, yeah, but you can't be anti-liberal. Um, so that's something different between America and China. In America, you can criticize all the government, the government all you want, and you can't in China, of course, which everyone knows, but um, in China you can criticize liberalism, but in America you can't. So yeah, basically in China, point. apart from Apart from speaking about the CCP and the government, um, you can talk about every, anything else, you know, um, any, any aspect of social Yeah, freedom. social issues. Yeah, you can, social you're issues, free to talk yeah. about whatever you want. There's free speech on and, 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 social issues. Yeah, and, and also, I mean, people here, I mean, especially the women, you see that they, they, they're very, um, they, they recognize the fact that men and women are fundamentally different. So, you know, when we, when we talk to women here, we often talk about the diff fundamental differences between men and women. Uh, what makes us different and what makes us complement each other and they tend to be very very receptive of that um, I imagine in the US when if you you know emphasize too much on the differences between the two genders uh, you get accused of sexism you know so yeah you're walking a fine line in the US yeah. if you talk about the differences between men and women because it I mean that's a very sensitive topic and it's like walking on eggshells somebody's gonna be pissed off or offended um, even though it's true so in America it's like being politically correct is more important than being honest and truthful, and that's a shame because I prefer being honest and truthful than being politically correct. So with political correctness, your freedom to be honest goes out the window. I mean, that's not freedom. Um, 
So, yeah, so generally the bottom line is in China you have a lot of social freedoms. You can be yourself, you can go out and meet people, um, you can make friends with girls, you can um, exchange numbers, uh, go out with them. Um, whereas in America, it, it, it's like people are, are just so closed and disconnected. And if you go out and it's like people don't talk to other people unless it's for business. So if I go out and try to meet girls, it's like I'm a creep and, and, and it's a very negative vibe. A very negative social vibe and, and a toxic one too. So I feel like I'm some creep in America if I go out and, and try to socialize or meet people because people don't in America people don't talk to strangers. Everything all everything is business related. You you only talk to people if you have business with to talk about, and that's it. So you know there's no social connection at all. Whereas here. You know, there's there's a feeling of social connection. There's a feeling of social harmony with people. That's what I've noticed. There's a feeling of, of natural social harmony, and, and it's hard to put into words. It's something you just have to see. Like, for example, a group of uh, friends in Asia, not just China, but Asia in general, a group of friends will get along harmoniously, and they're not going to fight or argue. You know, even if it's a, if it's a group of girls or a group of guys, um, they just get along peacefully and naturally. Whereas in, in the U.S., it's like a, in a group of friends, they're all... They have these big egos and they're competing against each other and it, it's very toxic. It's like you have to show that you're better than someone and you have to brag and be yeah. arrogant. And, and there's no harmony between people or even between a group of friends. There's no natural harmony in, a, in America that you have in China. And you sound like you want to add something about that. Oh, yeah. Um, well, yeah. In, um, I noticed in China, that a lot of people, okay, first, first of all, they, they, sh they, they have very strong relationships, strong friendship. Um, strong ties with with their childhood friends, uh, friends from school, um, you know, and, and these bonds tend to last for life. Basically, I mean, if if they're they're friends from the same city, same hometown, same school, same middle school, same high school as them, um, these tend to be bonds that last forever. I mean, they they, they keep very close, uh, keep keep in very close contact with them, um, and. Um, I also noticed though that that you know uh, among uh, people I, I, I guess uh, uh, people who work in the same office colleagues and stuff in many cases in China a lot of them because you know China is a huge city and a lot of people sorry huge country and a lot of people not working in uh, 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 in places where they were uh, born in um, uh, as in they were not working they're not working in their home city or hometown um, so in many cases uh, people are actually you know uh, domestic migrants so uh, uh, you know um, in many cases, uh, people are actually uh, uh, renting homes, uh, renting apartments with 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 fellow colleagues, um, and 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 they seem to get along really well. I mean, there seems to be much less politics and much less, um, you know, um, I guess, uh, if much less tension and, and and you know, people seem to get along really well. And and you know, uh, it's very co common for for colleagues to be to be to be friends in China. Whereas I find that, you know, from my personal experience in Singapore when I, I worked there before, that, um, you know, it was hard to become close friends with colleagues because there's, there was always this tension and this distrust due to the fact that, you know, maybe we were competing for uh, promotions or, you know, um, and there was a lot of office politics and tension within the office. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't mean to say that in China that that, that doesn't exist at all, but it, I think it seems to be to exist to a much lower, uh, a much smaller extent because pe there is a natural uh, bond among the people here, like, you know, and, and they seem to put personal relationships before career, before uh, career advancement even. So, um, yeah, that, that seems like a very natural thing to them, whereas in Singapore it seems like, you know, career matters more, uh, career is the first priority, it matters uh, more than anything else. Yeah, and isn't it true that in China, usually co-workers go out and they make friends and they, they go out for drinks or meals and they invite each other to their houses? So it's like your co-worker is a friend in China usually, whereas in America, yeah. co-workers yeah. hardly ever you know, go out together or go to each other's houses. It's like they keep their distance and, and keep it purely business for some reason. Yeah, I def definitely noticed that. I mean, a lot of people here, they, they, um, uh, they, they, they develop close friendships with their colleagues and... And yeah, you work their school friends as well. So, uh, in general, a lot of people. I mean, I mean, you know, um, we all know that that that, that America is a very alienated society. I mean, there there are stats that show that the average American um, feels that he has only one person in his life that he can confide in. You know, 
uh, what I see in China is that most people here seem, you know, there, there isn't that level of loneliness and most people seem to have a lot of people, a lot of friends that they can confide in and they're very close to their families as well. Uh, also, another point I'd like to add is that I don't have the exact stat for it, for it, but I know that a lot of, especially like in, in like say New York City in America, a lot of people are starting to live alone. You know, living alone is very common in America. In China, it's, it, it, it's, it's pretty rare to live alone, especially for women. Um, a lot of women here tend, you know, they live with their friends, they live with their sisters or relatives. But yeah, in, in general, in China, living alone is, 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 is considered not very normal. And, and, you know, a lot of people... Um, want to live with their, 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 their close friends and yeah, yeah I've, I've noticed uh, yeah another big difference is like in America almost every, everybody hates their roommate if they have a roommate oh, yeah. they'll That's say oh it's a roommate from hell story because people yeah. don't get along in America They're, the ego is very toxic and people just have no skill to get along with people there's no harmony and so yeah. it's like everyone in America if they share an apartment they hate their roommate and they have horror stories to tell about them but in China it's like most of the time when people have a roommate, they get along harmoniously. It's not like America at all. So that it's a big difference that nobody is talking about. I mean, yeah, yeah. I it's mean, a striking most, difference. Most girls I've gone out with here, I mean, they, they seem to be, uh, you know, have really close ties with their roommates. Um, usually, like, you know, they're almost best friends or really close friends. So, um, I don't know, it's for some reason in general, you know, there is a greater level of social harmony in, in China. So. Um, what you see in America isn't really normal, and 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 yeah, in Singapore too. When people live stay together, you know, there tends to be a lot of tension in politics. People don't get along as well. You see, in Singapore, people are, in America as well, people have a lot of acquaintances. People have a lot of Facebook friends. You know, people they they know, but they don't really connect with personally. You know, they're not really genuinely close to. You know, over here, I mean, people, Facebook is obviously banned in China, but I feel like people have a lot more, like, personal relationships. People have a lot of more uh, people that they can call close friends, people that they can rely on and confide in. You know, that that is a very fundamental difference. Um, and, and I don't see that in more alienated corporate societies like Singapore and, 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 a lot of, uh, and America. Yeah. Okay, now I want to talk about another interesting topic that, um, that, that I sh should that we should discuss because, um, yeah, and that's about the, the male to female ratio in China because a lot of people criticize China for like um, having too many men but not enough women and like there's a gender imbalance. But the thing is, in most Chinese cities or probably all the Chinese cities I've been to, which is maybe f uh, like six or seven cities so far, it seems like there's more women than men. So I don't see why everyone is saying, especially the media, is saying that there's too many men and not enough women. I mean, I, I see more women and most of them are very attractive and, and very feminine. And so, where does that myth come from? I mean, any idea? Um, well, um, uh, statistically speaking, there are more men than women in China, but I would like to see the stats on um, the gender ratios actually in urban Places like um, I mean, especially in first-year cities like Shenzhen and Guangzhou and Shanghai and Beijing. Um, so I mean, I I feel like yeah, I, I've noticed that same thing as well. I mean, I definitely don't see a, a, you know a, a a lack of women in, in the major cities. Um, another thing to to keep in mind as well when you when you are in China is that um, okay, they they I, I don't although, although we don't notice it, there may technically be more men than women in the major cities, slightly more men than women. But yeah, maybe we just don't notice the men and only pay attention to the women because yeah. they're, they're such stunners and lookers. That. <laughs> yeah, that's part. Of, that's a part of it. But also, as men, we tend to be less sensitive to the social economic status of a woman. So, for instance, if you see a woman who like who's working in the hotel, um, like say in the front desk, like a receptionist or, or a waitress, who you find attractive. Uh, who's physically attractive and um, you know you, you would consider a, an eligible girlfriend and future partner I mean you know um, social the social economic status of a woman doesn't really matter as much to a man um, but you see in, 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 in a major city like Shenzhen or Guangzhou there are gonna be a lot of men who also have also migrated from uh, more I guess simple background uh, simple rural places um, who are maybe doing uh, you know what we would consider to be more uh, I don't know. I should say menial, but you know, lower social status jobs like you know, um, you know, in the service industry or as construction workers and stuff. And and I guess what happens is that a lot of women, um, you know, in 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 the cities, 
they want to go for middle class men. They don't want to go for women who they uh, men who they consider to be, uh, you know, uh, blue collar. You know, um, for for us men, we don't care. We don't really see the differences that much. You know, we we uh we would be open to to both you know to girls from regardless of their social economic status so i mean as long as they're reasonably physically attractive they're feminine you know they they look like they make good make good partners their social economic status doesn't matter as much so i mean i guess maybe what what happens in a lot of the major cities is that a lot of the men from more rural backgrounds are kind of invisible to a lot of the women you know both middle class and 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 and, and um women who would be you know uh, as uh, 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 maybe of the working class you know whereas whereas men you know it, all the women are eligible for us we don't care about their social economic status as long as they're reasonably good looking you know as long as they're attractive enough and they're feminine enough and they're not too rough you know you know we we, we accept it so um i guess there is an imbalance in that sense and also if you're a foreigner who comes to china um you, you know if you're a foreigner from a first world country like america you know, you immediately be considered to be at least of middle class status. So, I mean, that that is an important difference that that the the media doesn't point out that you know in 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 um in China um, you know I mean, in, 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 even though there is a gender disparity um, you know uh, you got to consider the social the social economic status of the people as well. So there are a lot of 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 working and middle class women here chasing only middle class men. You know. So. Yeah, and well. When we discussed this in the forum on Happier Abroad, what people said was that um, that there are technically more men than women in China, but most of those men live in rural areas like farmlands or something, whereas most of the women go to the big cities to find work. And so that's why in the big city, it seems like there's more women than men, where, because most of those men are in rural areas like farms or, or I don't know, in, in the countryside or whatever. Is that the explanation? Or? Uh yeah that's that's part of it I mean apparently domestic migration is is um more commonly found in women than men um that that's part of it I mean but I mean to look at the bigger picture on the whole it's 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 just you know I mean despite all these all this talk about the gender uh imbalance in China uh you'll see that the marriage rates in China and the birth rates in China are actually higher than anywhere else in north uh, developed Northeast Asia it's going to be higher than Japan South Korea. Uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, easily, you know, and and keep in mind that China has uh, technically a one child policy, or they're trying they're trying to loosen it now. But China has a one child policy, and in, and despite that, it, it actually has a higher birth rate. In, sp in spite of all the restrictions of the one child policy, it actually has a higher birth rate than all these developed Northeast Asian countries. Um, and I'm not surprised. I mean, I look at how marriage minded and how family oriented the the women t are in China, and. You know, I'm not surprised that, you know, they, they, they tend to get, I mean, a lot of women here tend to get married at a younger age and they're more interested in having women. And they, on the whole, they're less career oriented than the women you see in um, uh, uh, other parts of developed Northeast Asia. Yeah, yeah so that's a surprising t statistic. I mean, so you're bas basically saying that China has a higher birth rate than Japan, Taiwan and Singapore, even though it's su there's supposed to be more government control in China, but... How is it that there's a higher birth rate than in those first world Asian countries, and maybe even than than in America too? Yeah, I mean it has to be. I mean it has to be down to I guess the the attitudes of the women. I mean and 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 you know um you know the the values in life. I mean, um in in China I guess I mean a lot of the women are you know they value family and having kids over career. Whereas, I mean, from my experience in Singapore, you know, in general, uh, for everyone, regardless of whether they're men or women, career is the most important thing in life. Money is the most important thing in life, you know, and... So, so it, just, it seems like if, if women become too career-oriented or, or too materialistic or too independent, in, like in the first world, then they don't need men and they don't want to start a family. They have less desires to start a family or for men or for romance or for relationships. Yeah then yeah then the birth rate goes down and that seems to be what's happening in first world developed countries like Japan, America, Taiwan, Singapore um, and that's a negative thing because yeah I mean economic development um, stifles relationships social connection and male female relationships because men and women naturally need each other they were made by nature or God or, or whatever to complement each other and 
when you make them when you make women independent um, or give them too much power or money it seems like they don't need men and so um, it, it it renders the human race in danger of being extinct because you know people don't reproduce anymore if they don't need each other if men and women don't need each other so um, so that's actually a negative thing you know and plus men and women are different because when men have power and money they still need women of course that which we all know whereas when women have power and money they, they suddenly don't need men they don't need the romance or you know the security or protection or the resources of a man and so um, so by making men and women equal ironically it makes them unequal because women don't need men the same way men need women so um, it actually does more harm than good in the long run and in Western cultures they never tell you this they tell you that economic progress is a win-win situation for everyone and that's not true it it destroys relationships it destroys human connection it destroys men and women relationships natural relationships and so that's a very important point and message that we need to be aware of that is not getting out because the mainstream media never talks about this and and even in the alternative media people don't talk about this because it's it's taboo um, to talk about this it's just a very forbidden subject that no one dares to talk about because it's it's very very politically incorrect and it sounds sexist to talk about men and women being different you know anything you want to add to that or yeah um yeah i mean his his i mean his the things have changed now i mean his, historically speaking um you know women needed men to protect and provide but because of you know the technological advancements of modern society um labor intensive jobs are no longer as valued as they were before uh, you know jobs that required hard labor physical strength are no longer as necessary as before and you know machines have taken the place of, of hard physical labor in many cases so um it, it, only in the context of modern society have have uh, women being able to, uh, uh, I guess, be integrated in, in into the economy without having to, I mean, without having, you know, without having the, the, the natural, uh, physical strength or so the ability to provide and protect um, the way that men did traditionally. Um, so, yeah, um, I, I feel like, you know, this... Um, <laughs> sorry. Okay, yeah, you can finish your point later. But what I want to say is that um, that one of the amazing important differences I see between like the women in China and over in America, for example, is that in China almost every female is, is very feminine. I mean, they look ladylike, they, their vibe is feminine, their appearance is feminine, their body language, their voice is feminine, their habits are feminine, their personality is feminine. It's like femininity is like, I mean, the most, you know, the, the dominant characteristic in the women here. Whereas in America, it's like, you know, almost, <laughs> almost every woman nowadays is very masculine and they don't seem very ladylike or feminine anymore. And in China, it's, it's it's very rare to see a woman that looks masculine, you know. Maybe, you know, if they're, I don't know, some of the older ones might, um, if they cut their hair short, they might start to look masculine. But yeah, among the young adult population and among girls, yeah, you never, almost never see a masculine female in China. Whereas in America, you know, almost every female is masculine nowadays. Um, to find a feminine woman in America, you'd have to take a time machine and go back to the 1960s or, or 70s or, or 50s, of course. That's when, when um, the women were more female, I mean more feminine. Um, so that's a huge difference. And, and not only that, but um, the, the uh, yeah, and, and not only that, but the, another big difference is that these feminine women are also down to earth. Um, which, you know, you'll never see in, in the U.S., you know, because, because, I mean, the only people that are down to earth in America are people who, who grew up in the 50s and 60s, but, you know, or, or maybe 70s, but anyone that grew up in the 80s or 90s in America, I mean, they're almost never down to earth, especially the women. So it, it's very hard to connect with people if they're not down to earth. And so the women in China are a lot easier to talk to and connect with and, and um, at, you know, as a friend or a dating 
because they're down to earth, and, and so um, that's a really major um, issue. Okay, um, we're back now from a break. Um, yeah, what I was saying earlier was that the amazing thing about China is that not only is pr practically every female feminine um, in terms of looks and personality and vibe and body language um, and <laughs> everything, but they're down to earth and, and you'll never see that in America. I mean, because to find a woman that's attractive, feminine and down to earth Trying to find that in America is like trying to find a needle in a hay haystack. It's impossible. You'd have to have a time machine and go back to the 60s or the 70s to find that. And you can even even see that on TV. Like when you turn on, when you watch a movie from the 60s or the 70s, the women in America do look feminine and down to earth and wholesome. You know, like like in Little House on the Prairie, for instance, in in that you know wholesome family TV show. Um, but if you look at modern TV, I mean, the women act very masculine, cold, unfeeling, and yeah, not feminine at all. I mean, they just they don't even seem like nice people. I mean, they just seem cold and mean spirited, and, and like no with no soul or feeling, and it's just terrible to see that. It, it's like it's like the movie Invasion of the Body Snatchers is coming true. Um, whereas in China, I, I would say that at least half the women are down to earth, maybe the majority. Of course, there's going to be spoiled, snobby women in China because China's a huge country with five times the population of America. Uh, is there like two billion people in China or uh, one, one billion? One point four billion. Okay, one point four billion people in China, and so you're going to get different types of people. But I would say that um, the majority, or at least half, the women are down to earth, and so they're sincere. They're easier to talk to and connect with. They're, they don't have this restless, toxic, arrogant vibe. Uh, that you commonly see in in America or or maybe Canada too, or in, um, so that's a huge huge difference that is very groundbreaking. I mean, it's so surreal to see women that are beautiful, attractive, and down to earth um, with genuine personalities and often easygoing personalities, because you'll never see that in America. And but in China, it's it's everywhere. The it's in the majority. It's that's a huge difference that guys need to know because if they knew that, they would say, holy cow, why didn't I come here sooner or why didn't someone tell me earlier? Because, I mean, nothing is worse than wasting time and regretting it later because, I mean, I mean, you know, especially for us adults, we're not getting any younger, so um, we have to make every moment of our lives meaningful, as meaningful as possible, because every time that goes by, each day and each week that goes by and each month, it doesn't come back. So um, we need to make the most of that and not live in regret. Because if, if you're, you know, in America wasting, you know, playing a losing game, and I mean, you're going to regret it, wasting your time with these women that don't need you and that are not friendly or and, and that are too masculine. Um, yeah, that's the most striking thing about China. Every woman is feminine. I mean, um, is there anything you want to add to that? Or yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I I think yeah, in China. Um, yeah, it's it's yeah. Most most women are are pretty feminine, and um, yeah, it's 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 um, you know, I it's 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 easier to interact with women with women in general here because. When you talk to them, you feel like you can, you know, immediately adopt a masculine role in the conversation. Yeah, you you said that the girl you're dating now makes you feel like a knight in shining armor. You you want to elaborate <laughs> on that? Well, yeah, I mean, I I mean, like a, a girl as feminine as her, I I you know, I, I would not find a girl like her in Singapore or or America, even nowadays. I mean, um, yeah, she's just naturally very feminine, you know, a traditional feminine sort of women, um, and yeah, I mean, women like her are pretty rare in, in developed countries now because they've been so indoctrinated by feminism um so yeah i mean i i didn't understand traditional femininity until i came to china i didn't i didn't really understand how it was to interact with a girl who was naturally feminine until i, I came to china yeah so, and they're also easy i mean a lot of them a high percentage are easy to start conversations with and yeah. in the last few weeks i mean we've met like probably a lot of girls during our travels and um, yeah so this we know this from personal experience real first-hand experience that the women here 
are different just from talking to them i mean making friends going out and, and just interacting uh, we've met a lot of people and um and they're we can tell you guarantee firsthand that the women are feminine here they're down to earth and you just don't see that in, in the west i mean even yeah. in europe they're not as feminine except if you go to eastern europe they're still pretty feminine but yeah and even in western europe and america yeah you don't they're just not that feminine anymore. Yeah, I think one of the most important things uh, about the differences about uh, social interaction dating here uh, with, with women, women is that you feel over here you, you feel at ease to be yourself. You feel like you don't have to play any mind games. You feel like you don't need any PUA. Uh, you just be yourself, be your masculine self, and you know, um, and she will be her feminine self. And and the interaction between the, the, the gender, the, the two, the different genders, um, comes very naturally. Um, so yeah, I mean that's that's one of the biggest biggest differences. Whereas you know when you're in Singapore, or you're in America, you feel like you need to play you need to play mind games. You need to you know get coaching training <laughs> in order to know how to talk to women. You know um, you know so um, so not only is it more natural natural to talk to women over here, but it's also much easier to sustain a relationship over here because in general the women seem to be more um, understanding more. Um, um, uh, 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 less self, less selfish, and less materialistic, less image conscious. So you know, um, I I feel like you know it's 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 much easier to to build and sustain a relationship with women over here. Whereas in in uh, uh, in a more westernized country, it feels like you, you you constantly have to keep jumping through hoops. You know, you keep having to play mind games. You keep having to you know play you know maybe political games with with the women you're with. Um, so. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, so and also basically, you know, I mean, if a woman is too masculine, independent, you don't really feel like you're in, con- you know, you are in control of a relationship. You don't feel like mm-hmm. a, you're a knight in shiny armor. She has to be very feminine for you to make yeah. you feel feel that way. And deep down, men want to be a knight in shiny armor t- to rescue a princess. That's how we're all biologically wired. But you know, modern Western society just doesn't allow that. Um, but another. Th- fascinating thing I've seen repeatedly every day is that in China we see many couples that look mismatched in that the guy you know looks less attractive than the woman so basically you see a lot of guys that look nerdy or dorky guys that in America would never be able to date anybody or get any dates at all yet in China they're with hot beautiful girls and we've taken so many pictures of these and and so we can prove it this is real it's true these mismatched couples are are common in China, whereas in the U.S., you would see the exact opposite. You'd see an average-looking woman with a guy that's better looking than her, that's tall and handsome. So it's like in the U.S., it's the exact opposite. You see average females with um, men that are better looking than them. And in China, it's it's the opposite of that. You see many men that aren't that good looking. Of course, in China, the popula- the number of ha- handsome, good looking men is probably small. So the, per- so there aren't that many you know hot guys in in China. So the women don't you know re- they, they probably aren't as picky about looks, you know, as they are in the in the U.S. So, um, so so that's what, so in China you yeah everywhere you go you would see couples. I mean probably in the majority of couples maybe where the woman is better looking than the man, and you just don't see that in the U.S. What do you think? I mean, Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, um, yeah I, I mean, in, in general, um, over here, there, yeah. Uh, well, I, I think, it, it, I mean, it's, it's also, I mean, biologically speaking, um, in a human race, uh, males are supposed to be the more uh, physically, uh, sorry, females are supposed to be more physically um, attractive than, than females in general. Um, so, um I mean, and, and over here, I, I don't think, uh, you know, uh, 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 women care as much about the, the physical appearance of a man. Um, you know, they're more interested in the guy being of good personality and, and, and being a stable, you know, um, emotionally and financially stable guy. Um, whereas, um, you know, I guess I know, overseas maybe it looks better more for a guy now. Uh, but I mean, traditionally speaking, in any way, in any case, um, you know, looks if even if you're a good-looking male, it has much less pull over a female than than looks uh, and a female have would have over a guy, you know, because females tend to have a lower, in general, a lower sex drive than men do, 
um, so you know I mean um, I guess this is you know just a very um, natural thing I mean yeah, so. yes um, definitely so anyways we're gonna talk about a few more things and then wrap it up and then in the future later on we might do a part two of this discussion because we have a lot more to talk about but um, we're gonna go out to, to go out to dinner soon so um, so maybe we'll continue this with a part two later but I just wanted to talk about a few more interesting things and then yeah and then we'll wrap it up and one is that in China there's there's um, other freedoms that you don't have in the US which is um, you mentioned that a person could anyone can buy or drink alcohol without an age restriction yeah if, from, from my understanding over here I mean anyone can buy alcohol um, uh, in regardless of age I mean kids can, can buy alcohol at a, at a convenience store if they want to um, also over here you can drink alcohol any way you want or, um, you know there is no restriction against um, public drinking or even if there is it's not enforced you know so, so you can just walk on the street with a beer or in yeah, the park you can. Or yeah I've done it you know before and um, you know and, and yeah you know you can you can bring a bottle of wine to the to, to um, seaside and drink as well and yeah or to the park and drink as well uh -huh. I mean it you know it's very common and, and you can't do that in America or Singapore or? you can I mean uh, you can't do that in America that's been a law for a long time as, as far as I know uh, in Singapore we recently adopted the same law as well like um, you can't drink in public uh, over most hours of, 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 uh, of the day so um, yeah I mean you know, in China, all all these aspects of social of social life are not restricted. You know, another another thing about China as well is that you can freely open a bank account even even as a tourist. You know, almost anyone can open a bank account. All you need is a local mobile number, which almost anyone can get. You can just buy a SIM card at almost any convenience store in China, and 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 um with that you uh, and, and with the hotel address which you know basically you know the bank doesn't care so much about I mean all you need is basically a sim card um, a, phone, a mobile phone number and, and a hotel address to open a bank account in China I've, I've opened bank accounts uh, in, in like in Shanghai before as a tourist um, so yeah I mean and and you know so it's you know I, 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 even in Hong Kong or Singapore uh, countries that are, that are supposed to be technically economically more free countries than China um, There are actually a lot of restrictions on opening a bank account You know, you have to have, prove that you are a long-term resident You have to prove that companies have sent you letters uh, with your um, name to that address that you give to the bank um, You know, you have to prove that you have a visa to stay in China I mean, uh, to stay in that, that, that country um, you know, in China there isn't this restriction anymore at, at all. I mean, anyone, anybody, anyone can can open a bank account. You know, um, and this is you know one of many aspects of freedom that and that you have in China that that people on the outside don't realize at all. Yeah, even you I know. can open a bank account then. Yeah, yeah, you you certainly can, I, and I recommend I recommend you do. I mean, um, yeah, it makes things more convenient. Yeah, I mean, and then with a Union Pay card, you can make payments much easily uh, online and offline throughout China. Well. Yeah. Oh, that's great. So, yeah, so if you love beer, that's good news for you. <laughs> <laughs> and another important thing that I noticed is that when I was in Guangzhou, actually we went, me and e Ethan went together, um, I went to, to get some medicine from a hospital, and the doctor visit was like about one dollar. I mean, I, I was surprised. I mean, I don't have any health insurance here, and yet my doctor visit only was only, or consultation was only one dollar, and then the medicine I got was like six dollars. And yeah. um, in the U.S., I mean, gosh, I mean, healthcare is so so ex ridiculously expensive. I mean, and we talked to Z Boy about this on the forum too, and he said that when he got treated for um, uh, tonsillitis or something or some infection, it was dirt cheap in in China. It only costed a few dollars, whereas or something. Whereas in the U.S., it would have costed him hundreds of dollars to get such treatment for tonsillitis or whatever. Yeah. And so, yeah, healthcare in the U.S. is, is is a huge mess and it's ridiculous. So, yeah, that's plus, a, that's a, plus when you went to the hospital as well, you, you didn't have to show your ID, right? I mean, you didn't have to, you know. No, show I'm, and and I, I hardly waited. I mean, I only yeah. waited maybe five minutes in the yeah. waiting room. And yeah. this is important because health care is important, and um, you know it gives you more peace of mind to know that a doctor visit is is either cheap or really affordable. And so that's a big secret. Like if you need surgery, for example, or an important operation, 
you could probably come to a place like China or Taiwan or some overseas country and get it done for a lot cheaper than in America. And that's a big secret that is not talked yeah. about in America. And so yeah. that's a big benefit. And yeah, if you and see it, the Michael Moore film uh, documentary called Sicko, it even goes into that and gives specific examples. Yeah, I, I think a lot of healthcare is actually subsidized by the government here, but they don't talk about it. Um, yeah, and also uh, from my understanding, um, doctors don't get paid as well in China as they do overseas uh, in, in many Western countries. Uh, but still, a lot of people become doctors and they become decent. I mean, you know, of, of decent quality. I mean, they they become reasonably good doctors. Um, um, you know, despite you know the relatively low pay. So, um, yeah, very interestingly, I mean, a lot of 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 important services. Um, you know, can be had for for a low price in China, and in general, the cost of living in China is is certainly much much lower than than you know in my country, Singapore, and 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 in the U.S. as well in many ways. Um, you know, uh, so yeah, I mean that's that's a uh, you know, uh, oh, oh, I mean like in terms of like say renting an apartment in China, I, I say on, it, it depends on which city you're in. You know, it depends on whether you're in a first tier city or a second tier city. Um, but in general, I mean, like say in Shenzhen or Guangzhou, you can rent a decent apartment for like six to eight hundred, uh, maybe six to seven hundred U.S. dollars a month, and and this is in the heart of of you know a uh, uh, one of the, you know major cities in China, you know where you in a city center of a very major city in China where you know your life your life would be very convenient. You you know you're surrounded by. Um, shopping streets, malls, you know, hot women, <laughs> um, banks, um, hospitals, um, you know, restaurants everywhere, anything you need, you know, the, the level of convenience here uh, is much higher than, than I've experienced anywhere in the West. Uh, plus, to get to these places, you wouldn't even need to, um, in, in many cases, like, it's very normal to live so close to all these modern conveniences that you don't even need to, 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 to take a subway, you don't even need to take a, a, a taxi, to, to get to these restaurants, but banks, uh, bars, um, you know, uh, um, you know, post offices, whatever. Yeah, I'm surprised how how modern and convenient China is. I didn't expect it to be this modernized because in the movies they don't they usually show China as being more primitive. They don't show it yeah. to be this modernized. Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely. And and yeah, it seems like um, uh, I guess maybe maybe you know China is a lot more modernized than a lot of people. N- you know, think it is, but you know, maybe uh, the Chinese government isn't as good as as at, at um PR as as um <laughs> some of the Western governments are. I, I mean, yeah, and yeah. for me, um, most important freedom is is um the freedom to be down to earth because my personality is very down to earth, and um in America, the thing is, the culture is very fake nowadays, and in order to fit into a fake culture, you have to be very fake. So. If you're not, then you're considered abnormal, you know. Um, so if you're down to earth in modern America, you're you're um, c- considered abnormal and strange, and because it's seen as a, as a you have to brag and show off and be be bravado and, and be arrogant and, and have a big ego. And so if you're down to earth, you're seen as weak and and abnormal. And um, whereas in China, the the Chinese culture is still very down to earth. So. If I'm down to earth, then you know it feels normal here, and for me, that's the biggest thing: is that I can be down to earth and not feel abnormal in China, um, because it's a down to earth culture. So you can be down to earth, whereas in America, the culture is not down to earth. So yeah, you, it it doesn't you don't feel like you fit in or thrive if you are down to earth. You have to be like a phony poser to to fit into American culture because it's largely based on hype, illusion, BS. Um, fakery, phoniness, uh, you know, etc. So, so yeah, that to me that's an important thing. So we just don't feel as persecuted. And Z Boy mentioned this too that he's no longer an angry Asian in America because you don't feel, you know, as oppressed, you know, for being who you are in China, you know, as you would be in America. Anyways, let's wrap this up for now. Um, anything you want to add before you go? Uh, no, not really. For now, I mean, I think we we've discussed a lot of the most important issues. <laughs> yeah, we <laughs> do have more issues to discuss, yeah, but we'll do it in a part two later. Okay. Um, so yeah, if you've gotten this far, thanks for listening. Um, um, <laughs> yeah, this is we're kind of free willing this and not following a particular structure. But yeah, I hope you found this informative, and I hope it'll make you. 
um, decide whether you want to live in China or not. And we'll get into more practical issues like cost of living and stuff um, in the next podcast. So, um, yeah, thanks for listening. We'll, and we'll talk to you next time. See you next time, I mean. Bye bye. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Then the parts of that are really.